Okay, so we've seen a variety of, of different models, from linear models, which are rather simple and easy to work with and interpret, to more complex models like nearest neighbor averaging and, and thin plate splines. And we need to know um, how to decide amongst these models. And so we need a way of assessing model accuracy and when is a model adequate um, and when may we improve it. Okay, so suppose we have a model f hat of x that's been fit to some training data and we will denote the training data by tr and that consists of n data pairs xi, yi. And remember, xi, the notation our xi means the ith observation and x may be a vector, so it may have a bunch of components. yi is, is typically a single y, a scalar. And we want to see how well this model performs. Well, we could compute the average squared prediction error over the training data. So that means we take our y, the observed y, we subtract from it f hat of x, we square the difference to get rid of the sign, and we just average those over all the training data. Well, as you may imagine, this may be biased towards more overfit models. Right? We saw with that thin place spline, we could fit the training data exactly. We could make this mean squared error subtrain. We could make it zero. Instead, we should, if possible, compute it using a fresh test data set, which we'll call TE. So that's a, an additional, say, M data pairs XI, YI, different from the training set. And then we compute the similar quantity, which we'll call mean squared error sub TE. Okay? And that may be a better reflection of the performance of our model. Okay, so now I'm going to show you some, um, some examples. We got back to one-dimensional function fitting. In the left-hand panel, we see the black curve, which is actually a simulated, so it's a generating curve. That's the true function that we want to estimate. The points are data points generated from that curve with error. And then we actually see, you have to look carefully in the plot, we see three different models fit to these data. There's the orange model, the blue model, and the green model. And they ordered in complexity. The orange model is a linear model. The blue model is a more flexible model, maybe some kind of spline, um, one-dimensional version of the thin plate spline. And then the green one is a much more flexible version of that, that you can see it gets closer to the data. Now since this is a simulated example, we can compute the mean squared error on a very large population of test data. And so in the right-hand plot, we plot the mean squared error for this large population of test data, and that's the red curve. And you'll notice that it starts off high for the very rigid model. It drops down and becomes quite low for the in-between model, but then for the more flexible model, it starts increasing again. Of course, the mean squared error on the training data, that's the gray curve, just keeps on decreasing, because the more flexible the model, the closer it gets to the data point. But for the mean squared error on the test data, we can see there's, there's kind of a, a magic point, which is the point at which it minimizes the mean squared error. And in this case, that's this point over here. And it turns out it's pretty much spot on for our middle, um, the medium flexible model in, the, in this figure. And if you look closely at the plot, you'll see that, that the blue curve actually gets fairly close to the, to the black curve. Okay. Again, because this is a simulation model, the horizontal dotted line is the mean squared error that the true function makes. For, the, for data from this population. And of course, that is the irreducible error, which we call the variance of epsilon. Here's another example of the same kind, but here the true function is actually very smooth. Same setup. Well, now we see that the mean squared error, the linear model does pretty well. The best model is not much different from the linear model. And the wiggly one, of course, is overfitting again, and so it's making big prediction errors. The training error again keeps on going down. And finally, here's a, quite a, a wiggly true function on the left. 
The linear model does a really lousy job. The, the most flexible model does about the best. The blue model and the green model are, are pretty good, uh, pretty close together in terms of the mean squared error on the test data. So I think this drums home the point. Again, the training mean squared error just keeps on going down. So this drums home the point that if we want to have a model that has good prediction error, and that's measured here in terms of mean squared prediction error on the test data, we'd like to be able to estimate this curve. And one way you can do that, the red curve, you can do that is to have a held out test data set that you can value the performance of your different models on the, on the test data set. And we're going to talk about ways of doing this um, um, later on in the course. I want to tell you about a, um, one aspect of this which is called a bias variance trade-off. So, so again, we've got a f hat of x, which is fit to the training data. And let's say x0, zero, y0 zero is, a, is a test observation drawn from the population, and we're going to e evaluate the model at this test ob at the single test observation. Okay? And let's suppose the true model is given by the function f again, where f is the regression function or, or the conditional expectation in the population. So let's look at the expected prediction error between f hat at x0, so that's the predicted model, the fitted model on the training data evaluated at the new point x0, and see how, what the expected distance is from the test point y0. So that, this expected this expectation averages over the variability of the new y0, as well as the variability that went into the training set used to build um, f hat. So it turns out that we can break this, we, we, we can break up this expression into three pieces exactly. The one piece is again the irreducible error that comes from the random variation in the, in the new test point y0 about the true function f. But these other two pieces break up the reducible part of the error, what we called the reducible part before, into two components. One is called the variance of f hat, and that's the variance that comes from having different training sets. If I got a new training set and I fit my model again, I'd have a different function f hat. And so as I were, if I were to look at many, many different training sets, there would be variability in my prediction at x0. And then a quantity called the bias of, of f hat. And what the bias is, is the difference between the average prediction at x0, averaged over all these different training sets, and the true f at, at x0. And what you have is typically as the flexibility of f hat increases, its variance increases, because it's going after the individual training set that you've provided, which will of course be different from the next training set but its bias decreases. So choosing the flexibility based on average test error amounts to what we call a bias variance trade-off. This will come up um, a lot in, in, in future parts of the course. For those three examples, uh, we see the bias variance trade-off. Again, in this plot, the red curve is the mean squared error on the test data. And then below it, we have the two components of that mean squared error, the two important components, which are the bias and the variance. And in the, in the left plot, we've got the, the, um, the bias decreasing and then flattening off as we get more flexible and the variance increasing. And when you add those two components, you get the U-shaped curve. And in the, in the middle and, and last plots that correspond to the, those, the, the other two examples, um, the same decomposition is given. And because the nature of that problem changed, the, the, the trade-off is changing. Okay, so we've seen now that choosing the amount of flexibility of a model um, amounts to a bias variance trade-off. And depending on the problem, we might want to make that trade-off in, in a different place. And we, we, gonna, we can use um, a validation set or, or uh, left out data to help us make that choice. But that's, a cho that's the choice that needs to be make, made to select the, um, the model. Now, we've been addressing this in terms of uh, regression problems, 
In the next segment, we're going to see how all this works for classification problems.